Okay, we are live. Welcome to the Lovecraft Easy and Video Talk Show. Uh, we do this every Sunday at 6 o'clock Eastern. And today I am talking with author Kathy Koja. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Mike. And, Hi, everybody. Uh, Joe Pulver is sick, all you Joe Pulver fans out there. And I think Pete's sick as well, but we'll have fun without him. So um, <laughs> right, we'll have more yeah. fun. <laughs> um, it's the spirit. Hey, <laughs> uh, oh, and we're going to, uh, I think we decided we're going to swear a lot on this yeah. show, too. Yeah. So. Wait, 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 so you can't. Here, I'm glad you're here. Olivia. And, um, <laughs> um, no, seriously, thanks without... for being on the show. So, um, Thank you for having me. I've been excited about doing this, especially like all the swears and stuff. I heard Mike <laughs> is like, you got his really foul mouth, so I'm super pumped. <laughs> no, no, that's Lydia yeah, Llewellyn. Yeah. He's our resident swearer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Olivia Llewellyn, yeah, she's going to come back someday and swear a lot for us. Hey, I, I got a question for you to start off with. I was I was looking at, I think it was on the cipher, uh, yeah, um, and it it's that little bio of you at the at the end. Oh, um, Kathy, <laughs> I know oh, this was from God. 19. Uh, Kathy Koja has at various times been a bonsai lumberjack an oyster cowboy, and a freelance criminologist. So I, I won't put you on the spot for all those, but I'm really curious about the freelance criminologist thing. You know, you know how you sit around with your friends and you make up silly things and you all <laughs> laugh? And yeah. then somebody puts it on the back of the book and it stops being funny? <laughs> that, yeah, you got to figure out something to put on there. <laughs> I, and you know, I will say this. After how many years doing this, it never gets easier trying to figure out what what do you say back there that will give people who might be interested, although now we have the internet, so we don't even need those things anymore, but to yeah. try to say, okay, what's interesting to people and what's not like super boring or I'm into word reading, blah, 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 blah. I mean, who really cares? So, but the oyster cowboy thing was just, yeah, no, no, it's all a lie. <laughs> Actually, at the time, um, a friend's, Father was an actual bonsai person, an award-winning like bonsai person. So that's probably where that came from. But all the rest was a lie. <laughs> well, and I, and I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit because it's pro it's from '90 or '91, something like oh, that. So um, that was your first book, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, how did you? I guess my first question is. Um, how did you get? How did this all start? Why? How did the cipher come about, and why did you start writing um, as opposed to whatever you were doing before? Um, I wasn't doing anything before. I was living like a horribly inauthentic life and not doing the thing that I was supposed to be doing, which was writing books. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Clarion Writers Workshop, which at the time was at Michigan State University in in East Lansing, Michigan. And I applied for the workshop, and I got in, much to my surprise. And after going there and kind of being, I guess, validated would be the best word. I come out of a very, um, very blue-collar, uh, working-class family and tradition, and I had no models of mm -hmm. what do you do if you, I mean, if you, you write stuff, that's awesome, so what? get a job, you know, yeah. so there was no way to think myself into the, the next step, and going to the workshop was the thing that there were writers there whose work I had loved and enjoyed, like Kate Wilhelm and Harlan Ellison and people like that, and they were all saying, yeah, you're good at this, you, you should probably do this, it's like, ah, ah, ah. Oh, wow. so, yeah, so then I started to do this, and Harlan Ellison was there? Yes, and you know what? Harlan was, pardon my hair, Harlan was so nice to us, and, uh, you know, a lot of the persona, I think, that he, he carried around, I will say this, something I learned from that workshop was we had many wonderful and, and famous and awesome writers came to talk to us, but the night before Harlan came in, everyone had some kind of issue with him either for good or for ill. I can't wait to meet him. Oh, I heard he's a prick. Blah, blah, blah. 
and it made you think, you know, this guy who none of us have ever met is walking into this room where everybody's got an opinion. And that was really sobering, you know, to think that people were judging him for good or for ill, not only on his work, but on the kind of writer he was perceived to be. And that was Things really... Things that they'd heard and didn't really know for sure. Right, and we didn't know him. You know, we and this was, you know, pre-internet. We used to, um, we wrote on wax tablets and stuff and, like, sent them across the sea to each other. And so we didn't have your fancy inner tubes like you kids <laughs> know. And not... Not knowing him as a person, but having all these perceived opinions about him, that was really sobering to think, you know, you're writing this stuff, but people are judging you on a totally different rubric. So that was a learning experience, too. It, it but still happens to me. Now. It still happens now. I, I see any kind of number of uh, times for like, writers are just kind of excoriated or chastised by a fan base for not conforming to someone's idea of what a writer should be doing and it just it's very why are you just why don't why do you, what do you care i mean why don't you just read the book yeah. oh it's a hundred times worse now a no, million yeah, times worse yeah oh uh, you know when you say you were living a very authentic life, you know, uh, I, I do have a lot of people that watch me that are beginning writers or that are writers, of course, and I think something, what you're saying is is no doubt very interesting to them. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit, maybe? I would love maybe. to elaborate on that. Um, <laughs> I think, especially if you don't have, you know, again, things are different and are better now than they used to be, but for kids who don't, kids, you know, for young people, young writers, or young as writers, if you don't have a model to look at, you don't necessarily know what what it means to do your work or to be a writer or to take that next step. Right. And you can see a lot, I mean, you can see a lot of things online. You can see it almost makes it worse. You see these things that are not, it's like looking at someone's Facebook, that's not their life. You right. Know? Yeah. I mean, let's, let's be real. I have a dirty sex right now. No one knows that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? They see yeah. things that are not real and they think I don't measure up to that. I'm not that kind of a writer, especially if you're working. I think it's easier now, but especially if you're working in genre, you know, where there's still that kind of, I have to laugh, when I, I started to write YA novels in whatever year that was, and my editor, Frances Foster, who was just, a, I got so lucky, she was a huge legend um, in, in children and young adult publishing, and she mm -hmm. said to me, Kathy, I have to tell you that I hope you won't be upset, and this is at Fair Strauss Giroux, you know this this hugely, you know, influential publisher, and Francis is, has her own Im imprint, and she's this wonderful editor. But she said, like, Kathy, I have to tell you that there is this prejudice against young people's literature, and I I hope you won't take it personally. And I didn't say it to her, but I thought, Francis, I came out of paperback horror. Nobody <laughs> treats you worse. Than paperback horror, okay? There's yeah, nothing anybody can say. Horror, right? <laughs> I know, right? It's like it, it doesn't. Yeah, I, I that doesn't bother me. I don't care. <laughs> I, you know, I'm I'm happy to be working with you. I'm happy to be writing what I'm writing. So I don't really care. But I do think people need to be encouraged, no matter what their their genre, no matter what they're trying to do. Look for the examples around you in the world that are that are germane to what you're trying to do right. and believe that you can do it. And, you know, that sounds like, you know, put me in coach. I can do it. But seriously, believe that, that this is something that you can do. If you're good at it and getting better, just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Don't let anything stop you. That includes your near and dear ones, especially the ones who go, oh, you're so wonderful. You do everything wonderful. Your books are great. Your stories are great. They're not that great. You can get better. We all have to get better. So, right. and, because that, that's 
that's kind of the trap with a workshop too because you you want people who understand what you're doing and can encourage you but you also want people to say that's kind of shy you know you can you could do better or I don't understand this or because it teaches you what to listen to and what what's safe to discard right. we all need to know we need to know that um, so the cipher was your first book um, I this is probably a question you've been asked a lot, but a, a reader wanted me to ask you. Um, seems like such a strange idea, and she wanted to know, and I want to know, where did you come up with that? Um, you know, what? How, how did that come about? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Where does anything come Too long from, ago. right? <laughs> I just don't know. Um, the word fun hole. Um, yeah. Came from my husband Rick Leader, who never gets credit for originating the, the title Fun Hole and we really wanted to retain that as the book's title and we were totally shot down so I guess for then obvious reasons it was it was odd enough I guess that the Dell was choosing to launch an imprint with this bizarre book but to call it the Fun Hole I guess would have been totally beyond the pale but there was a, a there was a, a beginning manuscript with a character analogous kind of to Nicholas that grew into the the fun hole or the cipher but I had been working on that for a while and it just kept growing organically um, like now I had no idea how it was going to end I don't know how anything I ever write is going to end because what would be the fun right yeah sure, if it ends why do it well, and every, every writer does uh, it differently. Go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry. I thought there was similarity. I don't know if um, you'd agree. I thought there was a, a certain similarity to a story by Clark Ashton Smith called The City of the Singing Flame. I don't know if you ever read that. No, I don't know it. But it's not a new idea either. I mean, I didn't, you know, this, this is a trope. I didn't originate it. And that other people have done... Um, Jonathan Lethem wrote a book with kind of the same conceit, not long, or in the same, like, 10 years or whatever, whatever, and somebody else did something with it not long ago, and it's not a new idea, but I think it's interesting as a, I recently reread it, in fact, um, with someone who's working on a script, and got a completely different, read on the Nicholas character than I did when I was writing the book. I look at it now and think, what a self-centered prick, you know? He's just awful. He's just awful. Everything is about him. Why didn't he just move to Tulsa? He could have put a stop to all of this, you know, but he never did. And that, to me, that's the horror now and the tragedy of it, that this person who's constantly like, Poor me, everyone's doing these terrible things, and now I'm going into this room and shutting the door. I hope it'll stop. You yeah. liar, right? What a horrible yeah. guy. No, wait, wait, um, I heard you say script. What yeah. was, is it being written into a TV or a movie or something? Well, there's, there's always lots of interest in the cipher, which I think proves the, the staying power of that whole idea, this null thing, you know, this null. What's interesting to me is thinking of people, I don't know how you could make any kind of film or anything about this in, or how you would incorporate the whole idea of the internet. It, because nowadays, come on, you know, you know that girl would be throwing that camera down that hole, and we would all be watching it live. Yeah, it'd be on YouTube five minutes oh, after they found it. it'd have its own channel, right? The Fun Hole yeah. channel, 24-7, which would make it a completely different story. You know, I, I don't know how, if you're faithful to the book, I don't know how you'd make it into a movie, but it would make a great, like, Twilight Zone type of episode, you know, I think. Uh, of course, I'm not a movie maker, but... I always wanted it to be a graphic novel. I think it would make an excellent graphic yeah. novel. Wouldn't yeah, it be cool? Would. Someone should do that. Somebody yeah. do that. Someone out there do that because that would be awesome. That would be. Uh, do you, you know, 
I've got a Lovecraftian magazine and show here, so I, but I don't want to look at everything through Lovecraftian glasses. But you know, it seemed like with that novel, at least, there's definitely some Lovecraftian themes there. Um, did you have that in mind, or is just that just just came out that way? Um, are you much of a Lovecraft fan? I. Or at least I for love the him, thing. but I'm not in love with him. I. I'm more of an M.R. James girl. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a huge fan of M.R. James because it's always... And M.R. James scarred me as a young person. So you always remember you know, your first hideous wound. And yeah. there's an M.R. James story where the... And it's just, it's just like in passing, but the protagonist puts his hands under the pillow and there's a mouth under there with teeth in it. Think about that tonight. Think yeah. about that when you go to bed tonight. No, that's okay. <laughs> what is your favorite M.R. James story? Oh, casting the runes, probably. But you know, they're all. Do you know? Do you know the the part in the story where the horrible guy is doing the magic lantern show for the children, and there's these disgusting noises, these slithering, horrible noises in the audience, and it's mimicking what's on the screen, and the kids are getting more and more panic-stricken. That's so great. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that one day. I do have an immersive performance uh, ensemble that I work with, so maybe we'll, we'll do that one day and really scare the shit out of people. Well, so much of this, what you're talking about, your work, Lovecraft included, um, falls under you know what a lot of us call weird fiction. Right. Um, you know, one of the, the description of weird fiction that I personally really like is um, things are not as they seem, is, is how someone put it. I forget who. I think it might have been Thomas Ligotti. But that really resonated with me. Um, and you know I have a good reason for asking you this. Uh, yeah. What's your thoughts on what weird weird fiction is. You know, if, if someone said, you know, had never read anything like weird fiction, said, Kathy, what, what the hell is weird fiction? How, what would you say to them? I like the definition of things are not as they seem, but I would extend it even a little further and say, you are not what you think you are. Mm. You have perceptive powers that you just don't use. And everything, what is the, the Haldane quote that says the universe is not only queerer than we imagine, it is queerer than we can imagine. Right. And and yes, I am getting exceptionally weird now because I'm I'm uh, editing with Mike Kelly, uh, Year's Best Weird Fiction too. And I yeah, have congratulations! It's a oh, great choice it's having you do that. So fun! It's really fun. And Mike is doing all the heavy lifting and taking in the stuff that everyone is sending to him. And then sending me, you know, the the cream of the crop. And I have read some stuff that's just blowing my mind. I'm loving it. But it is, it's all over the place. And as a genre, I think I don't I don't see how you could fail to find some note of interest in it, whoever you are. I don't care, you know, unless you're like really bad. And you read bad things. <laughs> Unless you're a really boring person. <laughs> Unless you're incredibly boring and you're, do you know, someone told me today on my Facebook page that I was talking about NPR and saying I wish NPR would sometimes use its outside voice. Oh, yeah, I saw that. that right. And funny. she said, well, you know, to some people that is kind of construed as being, you know, being classy about things. And she said, although I have been in stores where people say, oh, turn off NPR, it's just it's just too much. Wow. You know, what are you selling in those stores? They're saying, like, is it the Butterscotch Cloud store? Or what? <laughs> What's going on? So, yeah, those kind of people probably, but they need, they need it. They need the mouth under the pillow desperately. They need to know that life is Who's behind this interview? You. That, that'll get them going. I know, right? It's like, the, and some of these stories that I'm reading are, they, they're really running the arc from something that feels as blunt as a Flannery O'Connor story or as sly as, you know, as that mouth under the pillow, as, as James. 
there it has such an elastic definition and I can't see how anybody couldn't get something out of this genre. Yeah. Was, was Flannery O'Connor a major influence on you? Later on as I got older, yeah, very much so. I'm she's a tough cookie. I love her a lot. Flannery O'Connor and Shirley Jackson was a giant influence on me. Um, she wrote notes to a young writer um, is 19 paragraphs in the back of Come Along With Me, which was the the collection that was never um, never finished. She died. And 19 paragraphs that will, is a master class. Everybody should run out immediately and read that. That's all. Let's just stop what we're doing and go and read that. And <laughs> Thanks then, like, for watching, okay. everyone. Good night. I know. Thanks, you guys. This is great. <laughs> But you're, and she she was a person who taught me things like you don't need to tell your readers that Joe Blow got up in the morning and got washed up and got in the car and blah blah blah. They can figure that out. If if they're if you're bored, you're boring them. So don't leave out you can leave out the boring parts. It's okay. And that every single action in a story has to work for the story. Nothing should be in there that doesn't belong, especially in short fiction. But it works for novels too. You don't have space for that crap. Why put it in there? You know, if it doesn't, if it isn't necessary, why is it in there? Get rid of it. Well, since you're on that subject, what what other advice that people have, what would you like to pass on to anybody out there that's a beginning writer? Um, Please don't worry about the markets. Please don't worry about the markets. Please mm -hmm. don't. Please don't send me emails and questions and ask me and and not, I mean not just me, but don't don't let that be your first. Please don't. Good writing doesn't happen that way. Don't. You get a lot of emails asking you to tell them what's selling now or something. Or I mean, it, and it's even more basic than that. And I know in the in, you know in the beginning we all want that's what we want. We want stuff. There's a reason you know that all our blogs it says publish. It doesn't say upload because we mm -hmm. all want to be published. We want people. Why else do we do this, right? We're doing this so people can read it. So we'll be in a dialogue with right. somebody and say, hey, listen, I'll tell you this thing, and then someone to listen. But to me, that is working backwards. You're working against yourself, and all the best work is going to come out of you because you really need to do it. I mean, that's the cliche, but it's the God's truth, man. There's, yeah. And there's no other reason to do it. I don't want to read what you think might sell. What do I care? You know, time is short. I'm going to die. Give me something really, really good that will keep me up at night. Put a mouth under my pillow, you know. And, and people, I think a lot of people have an inflated sense of, you know, you publish a book, now you're set for life, and you can't publish <laughs> books. And, you know, you, you don't have to worry about money anymore, and so on and so forth, you know. Oh, that's awesome. People, yeah, people yeah. think that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of people, I'm, yeah, a lot of people think that. But that's crazy. Um, I mean, that's not the point either. No, Th no. That's not success. That That's just, that means, like, it's great if you can quit your day job. That's awesome. Or don't have a day job at all. You know, and just try to figure out how to make it work. But which is actually what I tell the, especially the young performers that I work with in my my ensemble, Nerve. Um, I think they should all quit their day jobs. I think. Yes, that, um, I want to ask you about Nerve, but I also want to ask you about that because I saw a post by you, and I even mentioned you on the show maybe a month ago, um, and saying that I saw this post where I think, if I remember right, somebody asked you something about whether they should quit their day job and your yeah. answer was an unequivocal yes can you can you talk about that you seem to be very passionate about that and I, I'd really like to hear more about your thoughts I, I am and I'll, I actually I'll tell the story quickly that I told that no, I, told take your um, I was sitting in a, a cafe waiting to meet one of my young actors and this delivery or service truck pulled up next to the storefront windows. Mm -hmm. I looked at it and there was something about the name or the logo that was familiar to me. And then I realized, my God, I used to work there. That was the last like real job that I had. It was a, a just for the record, it was a company that services restaurant grade appliances so like if your boiler explodes all over the fettuccine you would call these guys and they would 
hook you up. Right. And I'm looking at this thing and going, they're still in business. I could still be working there. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? It was horrifying. You could feel like the wind of the bullet passing past your head and thinking, I could have spent my entire life there going, one of these days, I'm going to stop and write. Yeah, I'm going to write that book. Yeah, it's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, quit your day job. Quit, quit it. Just quit it. You don't know what's going to happen to you. Nobody knows what's going to happen from one day to the next. You know, as, as recent events in the news prove, you can be at work and someone can blow you away. Okay. Oh, or yeah. you can be anywhere. You could be hit by a bus. Whatever. So, Life please, is short. you know, do not wait. Yeah, I was, uh, I was 17 after I graduated high school. I graduated a year early. I moved down to Texas to live with relatives. And they got me this job at this factory at a government contract. They were, uh, you know, building bomb shells and so on and so forth. So for 10 hours a day, they were real proud that they got me this job, and I was appreciative. I was 17, but for 10 hours a day, I would stand on an assembly line, um, you know, measuring the uh, bombshells, make sure they were up to specs, and you know, you couldn't go to the bathroom. If you went to the bathroom, you had to run because oh, God. they'd start to pile up on the assembly line. And I remember still to this day, I'm 43. It's been so long ago, but this lady came up to me and she said, you know, you're really lucky to have this job, um, you know. I've been here for like, I don't know what she said, something like 15, 20 years, and there's a real job security here. You're really lucky you got in here. You know, as she was trying to encourage me, but it horrified me. You know, I thought, I, I, I saw my life unfold standing at that assembly line for the rest of my life, and I thought, I cannot, I can't do it. Good for care, you. I don't care how much I screw up, I can't do it. <laughs> so, and it's true because, and you know now, and, and I know, and the older you get, you see how quickly the time goes by, and you think, why would you sell your time on the planet, you know, for money? It's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. No, and, and I hasten to say there's plenty of people that, that love their jobs. You know, my wife's a great example of that. She's a school teacher. I mean, she, that's, it's, it's a, it's a calling to her, you know. So not everyone's the same, but no, uh, and you're, you're you don't talking have to, to be... those people who are. I, we know who you're talking to, yeah. And it isn't, and it isn't even that because you can be an intensely creative teacher. You can, you had better be people who go into teaching because they would rather write or do whatever. I mean, a pox on you. I'm sorry, but if you're not there to be a teacher, you are shortchanging your students. If that is not your joy, you shouldn't you shouldn't be anywhere. I know some intensely creative nurses. If you are sick, you want to be in their hospital because boy are they they are to me being creative it doesn't necessarily mean producing, you know, a book or whatever. It's it's bringing all the personality and all the resources to everything you've got and making it new every day and making it alive every day. That's being creative. Anybody can. Everybody should do that, right? Everybody should do that, right. because we—that's what we're for. And we would be—it would be a happier and better world. And we should all take turns being working on a, a sanitation truck. I also believe that everybody should right. take a turn at the bad jobs and the hard jobs, oh. and everybody. So yeah, you know, you know what's, like. what's that saying? Uh, I'm not going to think of it right now, but some of the effect of. Uh, Oh, you you can't appreciate the the sweet without the sour, and I've I've seen the sour. You know, I've had a lot of bad jobs, so I really appreciate my bad days doing this Lovecraft Easing job. It, I I really appreciate still doing it because I've I've had horrible oh, for sure. jobs. <laughs> right, it's like I've had bad days, and this isn't one of them. Right, this is not ever one of them. So yeah. So anyway, um, this is not writing is not all you do. Can you tell us about nerve? Yes, I can. I love nerve. I just started doing, um, and actually it was my writing that brought me into doing immersive theater because after I finished um, Under the Poppy, which was my first historical novel, and and don't ever say things like, ha, 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 I'll never do a trilogy because you will. That was, that's what will happen to you. So actually, the third book in the Poppy trilogy comes out this uh, this 
fall. It's called The Bastard's Paradise. But when I had done this book, I knew that like the, the rule was you had to have a book trailer. So I started putting together a creative team to create this trailer, and it was so much fun. And the book lent itself so well to theater that I decided I wanted to do um, an immersive version of this. And the only immersive stuff that I knew, um, there's a group called Punch Drunk who are based in London, and I've been reading about them. And when, isn't that funny? Now when we say reading, like the fingers move, I was reading about them. <laughs> So I, f I found out that they were coming to the States. This was in 2009. They were coming to Boston. And mm -hmm. I said, oh, my God, I have to go see, you know, what is this like? And the production that I saw was called Sleep No More, and it went on to become this, and is still this giant sensation in New York. But at the time, it was in Boston, and they used a four-story um, disused parochial school to stage Macbeth crossed with Hitchcock. And you were free to wander the space while things were happening and tableau oh, wow. were there to look at and there was an eel and it was great. There was an so, eel. There was an eel. There was an eel in this like <laughs> bloody bathtub. The eel was not harmed, but the No eels were harmed in this. No production. eels no eels were harmed. And they, there were things, it, they, they had figured it out to a molecular level. So if you opened one of the nightstand drawers, as I did, all the stuff was in there for you to look at. Like, Whoa, I didn't even know you could do this. This is so great. So then I came back and said, all right, we're going to do a version of Under the Poppy like this. And we did it in a Victorian, an early Albert Kahn house in Detroit and tricked it out like a Victorian brothel. And people came and they had a wild, wonderful time. So then I went to do it again. And then I just kept doing it. So the the production that we're working on now is a version of one of my favorite books in the universe, Wuthering Heights, and we're going to be doing it in, we're calling it the Urban Moor. It's in uh, an industrial uh, compound called the Russell Industrial Center in Detroit, and it's in conjunction with the gallery. Gallery 17 is our partner in this, and people will start out on the Moors with Kathy and Heathcliff and come into the gallery and they will leave with like dirt under their fingernails and like warm feelings just all over themselves. So it's going to be so much fun. Um, I saw a recent post of yours about Weathering, Weathering Heights. Um, what, why does that novel mean so much to you? Well, you know, if you, and especially if you look at the context, the times in which Emily Bronte was writing, and talk about someone who was doing what she wanted to do, okay? This book has, as far as I know, it's one of the earliest examples, not only of an unreliable narrator, because it's told in the voice of the family retainer, Nellie Dean, who's like the nice person. And then as you're reading this, you're going, you're a douche. Look at all the things you're doing, and you always have an excuse, and you, you're not nice, Nellie Dean, but I don't like you. And when I first read this as a kid, it blew my mind for that reason, because I'm thinking, wait a minute. I don't, I don't believe what she's telling me. I don't think this is right. So the, the contrast between here is this unreliable narrator, here is this nested narration, we start out with a viewpoint character who is not really a viewpoint character, then we come into this other narration of Nellie who is telling us things that happened you know, 20 years ago and everything that happens, the difference between Emily Bronte and say Jane Austen, don't crucify me Janeites, but it's true, you are never afraid in Jane Austen. You've never said, oh Christ, I hope they get out of this in one piece in a Jane Austen book. You know they're yeah. going to get out of that one piece. Yeah. Or two P. I mean, there's just no, there's no urgency, you know. So that's what appealed to me as a young reader and what is keeps appealing to me as, you know, the much older and wiser reader I am today is that insane intensity. These people are not afraid to be who they are. And actually, that's the real tragedy of the book is that not that Kathy, you know, marries the rich guy and it doesn't work out, but that Kathy, you know, which circles back to what we started talking about. She's living an inauthentic life. 
Yeah. Okay, I'm going to marry this guy, but I'm going to kind of try to make it work, and then I'm going to use his money to help Heathcliff. And it's like, girl, you know that's not going to work. Yeah. But she does it anyway. And, you know, tragedy ensues, as tragedy will. But bringing, bringing books like that, bringing stories like that, um, prior to this we did a version of Alice in Wonderland called Alice, and the C in Alice was a V, and so it was Alice alive and the idea there was you are Alice when you come in to this wonderland and it's not safe and it's not half the time you can't see what's going on you don't know what's happening our one of our Tweedles gets brutally murdered March Hare gets brutally murdered spoiler alert um, <laughs> the Red Queen is a complete psycho the, the white king in our version was the pale king and was like the figure of chaos. So sometimes he's good, sometimes he's bad. You can't trust anybody. It seems like you're having a great time, then everything goes to hell, like life. Right. So we try to take these, these stories that, especially stories that people have a resonance to or a feeling for, and say, what's this really about? Or what is it about to us? What is it about... Yeah, what is it about to you guys? Yeah, and then come in and have any kind of like a like a book, right? Have any reaction to it that you want. We don't you're not sitting in a seat watching our shows. You know, you're running around through a space being prodded by weirdos. <laughs> you know, that just sounds so so cool. How how often do you do these productions? Uh, it last year we did last year was Alice. We only did Alice. Um, the year before we did Under the Poppy, and then we did a version of Christopher Marlowe's Faustus in a gigantic old pipe organ church, the sanctuary of a church. And the idea was Mephistopheles would meet you at the door and bring you in and then the deadly sins were in the space and they immediately, as soon as the door opened, they just rushed on you. And some people were completely traumatized by this. Some people sat with their feet up in the pew and said, I don't want them crawling around underneath and grabbing at me. And people were groped. People had their stuff taken from them. People were one woman got, I shouldn't laugh. I was, I'm not laughing at their reaction because I would do the same thing. I remember reading, uh, now we've always lived in the castle, um, Honey of Hill House, on my bed at like 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, the sun is streaming in the windows and the cats are sleeping. And I've read this book like a million times. And I'm reading it and Rick, my husband, walked in the room and I screamed and threw the book across the room. <laughs> so I totally feel these people who were freaking out. But I laugh because, to me, that's exciting that they engaged that hard with what was going on. I mean, we all know we're pretending. It's not really the devil. No one's selling their soul. We're in a church. We paid money to be here. But that they were so freaked out. Some people left their stuff in the church. And after the, the performance, we pushed them all out. The sins rushed them again and said, get out, get out, get out. <laughs> and they stood outside and said, could someone bring me my purse? I think my purse is still in there. I'm like, you can go in and get it. They're like, no, 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 no. Just somebody bring it to me. And that, the, and people have come up to me afterwards, after all our performances, and said, I'm still thinking about this. I'm still thinking about this. That's, yeah, what so that's, a, that's, a, that's a success. That, and that... That, and they go back to the original text. I went back and read Faustus. I went back and read. People are telling me now I'm reading Wuthering Heights because I want to get up to speed with what you guys are doing. That's amazing. That's what, what fiction is supposed to do. That's why I call what we do performative fiction more than you know theater or because it is happening. It's happening all around you. Speaking of that, um, are, you, are you trained as an actress or um, is this just something no. you just sort of got into? No, and I don't. I don't act. I direct. I adapt the stuff, and I direct. I do not act. Now, if someone's in the Detroit area or anywhere around there, and they're like, "I, I want to see the next one of these," how, you have a website for Nerve. Yes, you can go to GoNerve.com. GoNerve.com. GoNerve.com, okay. and as we speak, the ticket link is being set up. 
So okay. we the performances of Wuthering Heights will take place in April um, the 17th, 18th, and 24th, 25th. And in fact, a fan from Colorado has already bought his tickets on the early bird plan and is flying in to see the show because he missed oh, Alice awesome. and he was crushed and he is coming to Detroit to go on the Urban Moor. So. That's awesome. Um, well, getting back to to fiction, or books, I should say. <laughs> um, who are some of the authors that are writing today that you, you like to read? Um, do you just read weird fiction? or uh, Well, that's a dumb question. What are you reading now, and, and who do you like, I guess is a better way to put it. Well, this is my shameful secret, is that I am so behind on everything because I'm reading whatever I'm working on at the time is what I'm reading. So I just finished, like, a gigantic stack of commentary on Wuthering Heights, like just stuff after stuff after stuff. So I could discourse on that fairly knowledgeably. I don't. The, the only new things that I have read actually in the last few months are the stories that I'm getting in for Year's Best Weird Fiction, which I probably shouldn't talk about because I'm still reading stories. But I am yeah, so it's hard to find when you're editing something. It's hard to find time to read just for fun. You know? It's yeah. It's and I man, my hat is off like a million degrees to to Mike for being able to winnow stuff for I don't know how much stuff he's actually gotten. But I'm sure that people have sent a ton of stuff that may or may not be germane. So, in a couple times, he's complaining is too is too harsh a word for it. But he has mentioned ruefully, you know, that he's getting stuff, good stuff, but also other stuff that is not really, and that I don't know how editors cope with it. I mean, I don't know how people. It just shows such. A, why would you send me something that's not for me, right? Um, oh yeah, I I've gotten some weird stuff. I'll tell you. Um, I mean, weird, right? But weird, like not in the good way, but in the like you're like really. No, no, like uh, not just bad stuff, but this, it's a Lovecraftian magazine, so they'll send me a ghost story. You know, mm. you know that's you know you got to know that's not what I publish if you've read one issue. <laughs> well, it's in it's in the URL. <laughs> it's yeah, hard it not to, to know we've that, cleverly right? hid, we've cleverly hidden what the magazine has in the world. <laughs> right. so, um, no, it's about Lovecraft, so it's like about, you know, Pinterest hearts and stuff. Come on, that's the law of craft, right? Yeah, it's, it's a crafting website. <laughs> so, we love crafting. Um, that's horrible. That's so, think how horrible that would really be, though, right? The endless love craft, where like you just start making these things out of tatted felt, and you can't stop. You just can't stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, a variation on that question is, um, who did you read growing up that you think influenced you the most? I mean, you talked about a couple of those, but uh, who else um, influenced you? I came. I didn't have what you would call. Um, I, had a, I had a very substandard education, which turned out to be kind of great because it meant that I had to read stuff mm -hmm. on my own. And I remember reading Dracula when I was 10 and just going, wow, I didn't even know that this. And you know, meanwhile, I'm also reading. They didn't have YA then, but, you know, again, we had those wax tablets and it was a real pain. But you would read these awful books like from the children's section in the library and then you would read Dracula and it helped me develop which is something else I tell young or young to writing people get a shit detector hone your shit detector and the only way you can do that especially as a young person is to read and look at and listen to everything everything that's okay it's okay to look at that stuff because the bad stuff will start falling away and you'll start developing a taste for the good stuff. So things like that stayed with me. And I don't remember the bad books I read. I remember, and again, I was a little older when I came to Flannery, but I read Salinger. I read 
Dracula. I read a lot of ghost story anthologies. I read a lot of science fiction anthologies. My sister read science fiction, and so it was in the house. And, you know, proximity, right? It was there, and I read it. I'm whoa, this is really weird. And I remember reading Kate Wilhelm's Strangeness, Charm, and Spin, and just not even not understanding it, you know, but going, wow, this is really great. Um, having that door open to you as a reader makes you such a, so much a better writer than, yeah. and especially, I, I really think people, you should be guided by your taste, but you should read widely. Don't only read in one genre. Don't. It's bad for you. I mean, it's just bad for you as a, as, well, it's bad as a reader, but it's bad as a writer, too. You just don't, it doesn't stretch you. It's like people yeah, who I, still listen to, like, classic rock music, like, their entire life. Uh, you know. Yeah, I was, I was actually just thinking about that today. I'm, I'm in, as usual, in the middle of, like, you know, four or five different books, and one of them is this, uh, the Archie McNally series, which is this really light-hearted detective stuff, and then, you know, some of it's Lovecraftian fiction, and then some of it's yeah. science fiction. I thought, wow, I sure you read a lot of different stuff. You know, it doesn't... And it's, it really is. It's good for you. Stuff. It's really good for you, because yeah. it helps you... It helps you see not only how different things are done or how different writers accomplish things, but it gives you, it's like a different flavor. And maybe there's something that you'll find that you'll go, oh, wow. You know, that, or it might even lead you to a different kind of work yourself. I mean, I had no idea that I was going to start doing theater stuff at all, ever, never, never. But it's like, but this is so fun. You know, I have to, I have to do it. So. Um, uh, no. Go ahead. Who influenced me? Um, Dr. Seuss. I'm not kidding. Dr. Seuss was a huge influence on me. Some of the Jack London books that I read as a kid blew my mind. I love Jack London. Um, Joe March, Little Women. Yeah. Um, none of the, a lot of the other Alcott books were like not that great. But the books that I remember are, I mean, not that great to me, are like Dracula, like Wuthering Heights, the things that really stuck with me as a young person. And you know when it's a piece of art because you can keep going back to it and get more and more and more every time. I mean, the whole religious allegory of Dracula went over my head, you know, when I was 10. So what? Yeah. I went back to it and then I, I got it then. You know, who knows what's there? I'll read it, you know, 10 years from now. Who knows what I'll get? Yeah, right. Is Seawolf one of your favorites of Jack London? Which one? The, the Seawolf. No, I've never read that. I only know, I know the, I know White Fang and I know... Call the Wild. Oh, Call the Wild. Call the Wild. I know, what a great book. I mean, what a great, strange so many cruel things happen in that book and in White Fang too. It's horrifying. You know, there. I'm a big believer in not protecting people from experiencing art. You know, I'm not. When when our son was growing up, the only real rule that we had. Um, I remember him being a real little guy and wanting to read uh, Edward Gorey's Gashly Crumb Tinies, <laughs> and. You know, what What happens when someone tells you not to do something? I mean, I want to run oh, out and yeah. do all more, right? Right. So I said, you can't. I mean, it's in the living room. You can read it anytime you want. But just be aware that if you do, um, you can't get it out of your head. Once it's in there, it's in there forever. So make sure that you want it because you are installing that <laughs> software and you ain't getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. And he ended but up saying, you know, I think, uh, he said, I think I'll wait. I think I'll wait. And he, but that I mean that speaks to the power of it too. It's like if you read something powerful, it will stick with you. And I think kids should have that experience. I think that that people tend to underestimate their powers of resilience. And I think that's how you build resilience is by meeting something like that in a because kids are not stupid. If something's too much for them, especially in a book, they'll close it. Mm -hmm. They'll put it away. Visual media is a little more tough because there it is, right? You can't unsee it. 
But they're not stupid. They'll put it away if it feels threatening to them. And I think that's the best way. Yeah, it's the best way you can meet stuff like that is through an experience that you can control. So you've written a lot of horror. Why, you know, I ask people this and I always get a different answer, but why do you think people read horror? Why do we do that? Why do we scare ourselves like that and read, read horror books? I know why I read them. I think because we know that life is hard. We know that we're going to die. We know that there's a, a whole universe of pain that we can't really cope with. But if you acknowledge it and you open yourself up in a safe way by reading about you know, horrible vampires. Horrible vampires, not sparkly plenty ones. That teaches you nothing. That makes you stupid, young people, just in case you were wondering. Horrible, horrible sparkly vampires that abuse you. I, I know, really, it can't get much worse. Yeah, we won't even get off on that. I'm sorry I brought it up. But <laughs> I think being able to meet those awful things does make you... It's the, the truth of making yourself available to something awful also reinforces, I can, I can bear this. I can take this. I know that life is hard, but I think I can take it. And here's another way to examine that darkness. That's why I've never liked the stories where, and then the monster was vanquished and everything was great. The right. monster is never vanquished. It's never great. But it can be better. It can always be better. And, and sometimes it's just a pleasure to feel, to be afraid. To, I mean, why do people go on roller coasters, right? Yeah. The yeah. fools. I never go on roller coasters. That's for crazy people. That's for crazy. This is the worst story that I know about an amusement park. And Because we're getting really serious, so I'm going to tell like a really disgusting story. No, make sure you swear when you do it, too. Oh, know. yeah. It's fucking disgusting. Okay. Once upon a time, I was at an amusement park, and everything makes me vomit. So I can't go on any rides, even looking at rides. It's like, okay, this is not for me. So why I'm even at an amusement park, who the hell knows? But whatever that ride is called, it's like it has a pole, and then there are swings on it, and then you get, like, flung outwards on the oh, swing. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Whatever that's yeah, called. Yeah. So I'm standing under this, but at a safe distance, and all of a sudden, people start looking up at the sky and going, is it raining? Oh, God. <laughs> Someone was borrowing their about. brains out on this ride, and it was being flung everywhere. Oh, I laughed and laughed. There's no moral to that story except stay out. Oh, I, I got a couple like that, too. I, I had a friend who went on one called the Rotor. Have you ever heard of that? No, but it sounds really bad. You lean up against a wall, and the thing spins really fast. It holds you against the wall, and the floor drops out. So you get the sensation of you're just being held up against the wall by the force of the rotation. Yeah. Okay. He, he went on that, and he threw up, and everyone got spun around right through where oh. right through his vomit. And he said, as soon as the ride was over... He just like took off running down the exit. <laughs> Ran out of the park. Find me a shower. Find me a shower. Well, right. And those people will never forget him now, right? <laughs> They're like, remember that guy? Remember that guy that threw up all over us? Creep. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's a, you're right. That's a horrible story. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? But it was so memorable. And plus, it was fun. Nobody was like actually harmed or anything. So it was funny. But. Yeah, they. Uh, that's kind of the the what the 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 man against nature story, right? When nature wins, the subsets of stories. You know, sometimes I was teaching in a program that will go unnamed, and there was all these lists of things like, here's the this story, and here's the that story, and here's what you do. Um, can you tell me how to? It says that you can't write a story in, like, first person, this and such and blah, blah. And it's all these terms that I don't even know what they are. And I said, I don't know what those terms are. I think you should do whatever you want. And if it's a bad story, you'll know it because it won't be good. 
that will be your first clue. And then someone else will read it and go, I can't make heads or tails out of this crap. That's how you know. But all these, there's so many rules. You know, there really aren't any rules other than punctuation and proper yeah. grammar. I'm really bad at grammar, but thank God there are many, many copy editors who are not, and they have fixed my grammar. Um. Do you have a favorite of the books you've written? I'm really into Under the Poppy, probably because it's the the last one that I that I finished, and because that was very, it was more ambitious than anything that I'd ever done. And I will always have a soft spot in my heart for the cipher because it was straight up from the id, and I'm very proud and I continue to be very gratified that people read it and contact me and want to buy it and want to discuss it. I'm, I, I spoke to people in a way that continues to resonate and I'm so pleased and proud about that. Do you get questions on the cipher about, you know, okay, Kathy, so what was the nature of the, the fun hole? Did they ask you things like that? Actually, what they want to do is tell me what they see. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that that's why, to me, making any kind of a, of a film or any kind of rep, visual representation of that whole, I think what's most valuable in the story is that you don't see it. You, know, you don't. Everybody sees something different because that's kind of the nature of the beast, right? We all see... Holy crap, it's like 6.55. I just looked up there. We talked and talked. <laughs> yeah, I know. know. This, so is, late. this is awesome. So uh, so I, won't, I won't keep you much longer. I, Rick, do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say, so if somebody films uh, the cipher, you would want uh, it to be like a Val Luton horror movie where you don't see the monster. Right, or like, um, actually my secret dream, which is not going to be secret anymore, but I would love to see Guillermo del Toro do Bad Brains. That would be the oh, greatest. Yeah. Wouldn't that be awesome? I, I think he, yeah, I think he's the perfect director for your stuff. He just because he understands the monster and he loves the monster, and he feels Pan's Labyrinth. I think is one of the greatest movies ever made. I think that's unbelievably everything he does there is right, and the the horror. <laughs> is not so much the little dude with the eye hands, although he's, but the human cruelty at work there is breathtakingly oh, yeah. terrifying and yeah. beautifully done, but just, oh, so disturbing to watch, just horrible to watch. But yeah, I love him. I would love to see. Please do, well, please do Bad Brains, Guillermo del Toro, please, please do. <laughs> Well, obviously, millions and millions of people watch this this show. So I'm he's probably watching right now. So uh. sure, yeah. Oh, you know, you know, he's watching. He's a cool guy. He's a super cool guy. Yeah, he does seem like a very cool guy. He I, does. I love to have him on the show. And so, so not insane. Like so not about himself, and so not about. He seems like somebody that you would want to take out for coffee and just listen to him talk for hours yeah. because he's so full of lore and so down to earth and yeah I'm a huge fan um, what do you have coming up uh, what, you got any books coming up in the near future well the bastards paradise comes out this fall mm -hmm. and I am working on something now that draws on um, you know, in Detroit, we have this whole the whole phenomenon of you know rune porn and you know people coming into. Did anybody here see Only Lovers Left Alive, the Jarmusch film? No, Joe Pulver told us about it. I need to watch that. It's really worth seeing for, and I'm a big fan of his as well. But it was odd to watch it from a Detroit perspective. Simply, I mean, I recognize some of the locations and you know whatever. But something that I'm working on now draws on that phenomenon of what are buildings and places when they no longer are what they used to be, but they still exist? What is that's, that? That's very fascinating to me. Yeah. And, 
because some of the things it's it's some of the places here are just incredibly beautiful and some of their beauty does come from that ruin you know the Detroit is a very old city it was founded in 1701 and there are some structures that are still in use some churches and things that are just amazing um, and also people had skinnier butts back then if you go like in the choir lofts of some of these old churches you can barely get your butt in there I mean, so that they were they were a small but hardy race and I think yeah and I think they were shorter too they were shorter and they had tinier butts so they would probably win like in a death match with us they would they would hit us and run away and we'd just be stuck in our now, chairs. let's be careful here okay just talking about my profession for a second you're taught the vicissitudes of physical examination how you palpate the spleen the liver different signs in the abdomen that were all described in the 19th century by German physicians and they were all described on people who were basically starving and malnourished now you go and you try and apply this learning to the current American physique it just doesn't happen can you even find their spleens? it has to be the size of a football <laughs> Otherwise, nope. I seriously, it's it's disturbing. It, it, the the physiology, the human physiology. I have friends who are doctors. I have a good friend in particular who's an ER doc, and I hear stories that just blow my mind in the best possible way. And I asked him once, "Doesn't that make you talk about mortality? It's like, doesn't that make you feel like, oh, we're all living on borrowed time?" And he's like, "Nah, peeps be tough." People are people come back from things that you can't imagine, and they come back from it, and they walk out, walk out of the hospital. So there's our takeaway for the day, right? Peeps are tough. Yeah, yeah, that's a good takeaway. Uh, well, my last question is: you probably can't talk about your uh, best word fiction too much right now, but do, when's that going to come out, Volume Two? Do you know? I know that when my stuff is due, so I have to have stuff to Mike in like March. So I would presume fall, but I don't want to say anything you know wrong or dumb. So yeah. people just Google it and find out, and I guarantee you it will be worth the having because I'm reading some really really interesting stories and. I, I'm kind of a snob and I'm really hard to please and I'm bitchy and so if I am enjoying these I know that you will like them because you are you have a generous nature and you are all better readers than I am but yeah there and a lot of the bylines are new to me which is awesome I love finding new writers oh, yeah. to read so well, I, I truly believe that you are an excellent choice I think Mike Kelly had a wonderful idea with this this series and um, you were definitely a wonderful choice for volume two or year I'm two. I'm really so. pleased that he asked me. I said yes right away because I thought, wow, how cool is this? No, and and he did send me the the first volume, but I have not read it yet till I'm done. I don't want to be influenced by anything. You know, I'm excited to have it, but I haven't read it yet. Yeah, yeah, Matt, you have one last question. Well, this is from the message board. Someone oh, wanted okay. to know what is the scariest thing you've ever read. Mm. Good question. Probably um, either that mouth under the pillow, which clearly has scarred me, or uh, <laughs> yeah, behind scarred Hill House. Many people watching today, no? I oh, I hope so. Well, there's <laughs> a there's a moment in Haunting of Hill House where the narrator says Eleanor says she looks around the kitchen in this house and there are doors on every single wall, and she says, "What are they in the habit of seeing of meeting in this kitchen that they wanted a way out?" no matter which way they turned. And then she never says anything else about it. And that has bothered me for many years. I don't oh, know. If they, but yeah, she. Stephen King said about Shirley Jackson, she never had to raise her voice. And that's a fact. She's she's badass. She's badass. Yeah. She can sit on the badass bench with Emily Bronte, Christopher Marlowe, all of the true badasses. So yeah, that that scared me. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Kathy. You know, I I, I stumbled across the cipher many years ago, and um, I just I truly loved it. I love your work, and I'm always so gratified to meet someone that's talented and so, in addition to that, nice to talk to. So. Oh, really stop! Cool. 
Sarf, no, I'm serious. Sarf, Sarf, serious. Sarf, yeah. And we hardly even swore. We didn't even no. we told people we were going to no. swear. We didn't, like, nothing. Sorry. Okay, you guys are all going to have to insert your own swears because we clearly <laughs> failed. So, sorry. Well, well bring the audience with Livia. What's that? Bring you on with Livia. Yeah, yeah. My audience has been enjoying it, too, looking at the message board here. I'll just read you one comment real quick, and I'll let you go. Uh, Renee says, I've never even read her before, not to my recollection anyway, but I'm loving her as a human being. So Aww. there you go. You won everybody over. So. Good. Um, uh, thanks yeah, so much for being on the show. Read Kathy. Shirley Jackson, and then you can read me and read us both. But, like, read really good stuff. Thank you. And thank All you right. so much for having me. This is so much fun. Thank you. I hope I hope you'll come on again sometime. You. All you have to do is uh, exit out, just like a normal window, and then it'll it'll drop you out. Okay. So. All right. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye. Okay. Bye. Guys, I'm gonna run to my my wife. We're gonna play Monopoly, so my wife and son. Are, last so. thing. Last thing. Last thing. Oh yes. I'm Get sorry. I forgot to, uh, let me put you on the screen there. Okay. Back it up a little bit. Okay. Yeah, C is for Cthulhu. Matt's given it's us a way to board so book. This was created as a Kickstarter project. Uh, it's one of a number of, quote, children's books uh, for mythos. I know of uh, Mother Hydra's Mythos Rhymes and uh, Baby's First Mythos. Mm -hmm. But it's basically a, an ABC. It's a... <coughs> it's, um, Smoothed out a little bit for kitties, you know, so, so like in his house at Relia, Red Cthulhu waits dreaming, so there's a Red Cthulhu. But uh, otherwise, it, the art is very cute. I ended up with yeah, an I extra like that copy. Yeah, of Lovecraft. <laughs> That's actually my back. favorite is L Lovecraft. Let me, let me find that. Uh, let uh, me see the back, too, when you get done. So this is uh, L is for Lovecraft. Oh wow, that's awesome! That and awesome. here's the back. It's part of a wraparound photo. Um, the the thing is, like, this got sent to me like this. It's slightly bent. I think if you like pressed it under very heavy books for like two weeks, it'd be fine. And you can't be. Surprised. But I, I've got the same pack. I got it from, and I'm just gonna put it back in and uh, send it to whoever wins it. Well, thanks, Matt. So speaking of that, if you want this book, um, um, we give away a lot of books to the, for the live viewers. Just send me an email right now, lovecrafteasing at gmail.com, lovecrafteasine at gmail.com, and just put uh, see us for Cthulhu in the, uh, in the subject, if you would. That way I see it easily. And... Uh, doesn't matter what you say in the body of the email. And I'll use random.org uh, sometime in the next few minutes, and I'll pick someone, and I'll announce it on the message board, and I'll email you back, and then I'll Matt will send you the book. So thank, thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. Sure thing. So, well, Joe and Pete, if you're watching now or watching the recorded version later, I hope you guys get to feeling better. And uh, thanks, Matt and Rick, for being on the show, and thanks, to everybody, for watching. So. All right, you all have a good night. Sunday. Take care, Mike. Thanks, you too.